。好，欢迎回来。Welcome back. As we know that、uh, the stock market and as well as the foreign exchange market have、uh, suffered a lot of、uh, fluctuations, the top model, which has aroused a lot of concerns domestically and internationally. First of all, will the mo mo motivation or driving forces for economic growth be sustainable? Second, will the、uh, micro policies be as supportive as before? And the third one is,、uh, will the Chinese government be as decisive as before in encouraging, in、uh, promoting economic uh, growth? Well, the recent、uh, fluctuations of the stock market has demonstrated the uh, interwoven, uh, you know, impact of the Chinese market and the rest of the world. And RMB is in, in playing an important role. So we are talking about: Will the RMB soon become a leading global currency? This is the core question we are going to answer in. This session, at this session, to answer this question, we have invited a powerful team of、uh, panelists. First one beside me is、uh, Hazel Takanaka, who is the professor, faculty of policy management, at Kyoto University, Japan. He has served in different、uh, positions in Japanese government agencies, and beside him, we have Professor Huang Yiping from National School of Development, Peking University, member of the RMB、uh, think tank from People's Republic of China. I'm not representing PBOC. Well, I will make comments and、uh, participate in discussion on my own behalf. Mr. Andersberg, Chair of Global Financial System Initiative, World Economic Forum. Well, prior to that position, he is the Financial Minister of Switzerland. He is he is in the right position to talk about this topic. And beside him, we have Professor Li Daokui, Dean. Uh, Schwarzman scholars, Tsinghua University, People's Republic of China. Very interesting mix. Last but not the least, Lord Turner, senior fellow, the Institute for New Economic Thinking, the chair of FSA, United Kingdom. He has also contributed greatly to the improvement. In the climate change work global wide, is also very active in the financial、uh, arena worldwide. So let's start with the fluctuation of、uh, RMB rate, foreign exchange rate. In August eleventh this year, we witnessed the big change, the reform of RMB and devaluation of RMB. We saw a lot of.、Uh, You know reactions of this、uh, policy. What is the reason? What is the policy reason? The policy lo lo logics behind this RMB devaluation. The gentleman said that he is not representing PBOC, but he can share with us the mind on the PBOC about the currency reform. Theoretically, it, it is quite timing. Timely to have this reform, and also it's quite、uh, logical, but the result is unexpected. I say it is、uh, timely because we all chose the summer as the good time for the reform. August eleventh is the time that the Wall Street people take leaves off. And a lot of reporters and journalists take their leaves. In other countries, we want to take this as an opportunity for us to boost to、uh, launch this reform, so that we can prevent hiking of this reform,、uh, as well as the、uh, rate RMB rate、uh, against the U.S. dollar. Well, the Uh, RMB value against the U.S. dollar does not、uh, devaluate much. 
So it is a, a good time to launch the reform. At present, RMB is not international currency yet, but we can call it a quasi-international currency. The neighboring countries following devaluation of RMB is devaluating their currencies, so developing countries may show their worries. So the reform, the recent reform, uh, shows that uh, we have to keep into consideration the perspective and uh, the understanding about uh, China's reform uh, in other markets. The foreign exchange rate of RMB has been uh, has been uh, revaluated. Re uh, the, the valuation has increased by 20%. Well, I think this reform, the key point is that um, the forming mechanism has given a lot of weight to market mechanism. The market has been given more forces in the uh, reform. I think in the past, there are three channels for the uh, valuation of RMB. One is that the foreign exchange management um, administration will go to the market directly to buy the foreign exchange. Second, the PBOC set uh, the uh, range for the fluctuation of the value of RMB uh, foreign exchange rate, uh, about uh, 2%. Recently, the PBOC chose the third channel for intervention of the RMB uh, uh, for exchange ratio. Uh, it will set a middle rate. And then we increasingly find that uh, the, uh, mid, the mid uh, price of the uh, RMB foreign exchange rate is not related to the closing price of the previous day. So I think this is not a market force. So the August 11th reform, um, including 2% devaluation of RMB, among others, is to make the setting of the middle price of RMB foreign exchange rate will be more relevant to the value of RMB foreign exchange rate of previous year. I think this is the remarkable uh, move. As Professor Li Daokui mentioned, it has aroused a lot of uh, impact global wide. From other perspective, if you look at those some financial uh, statistics, M2 has increased by 900 billion. PBOC stated that uh, there is an increase of RMB issuance which has exerted pressure on devaluation of RMB. So what is your take on that, Professor Daokui and uh, Yiping? It is not the case. The uh, we see that um, the uh, we will see the flexibility of uh, the PBOC policy. Actually, you will see the gap. The gap actually reflect a huge amount of uh, capital has flood into non-real economy activities. That is the 900 billion you mentioned. I think this is the pain point that we have to think about here in China. I think there are different specific uh, problems like uh, liquidity, economic of elements, or SDR. I think the most important thing for us is whether we should uh, consolidate our market-driven refor uh, uh, reform. Let's move uh, on to SDR in a moment. Reform on the uh, August 11th. Uh, Lord Turner, do you think it's a good timing? Do you agree with the uh, Professor Li Daokui said it's a very good timing? I think these things are very difficult to pick any particular timing, and I'm not sure I'd uh, try and pick a time when you think the journalists are on holiday. That tends to 
it tends to backfire a bit if you mm. use those techniques. I think the thing to say about what happened in August is there were, there were two things going on. One was a set of technical changes to the way that the rate was set. And if that was all that was occurred, it would not have produced as much excitement. The excitement came from the relatively small devaluation against mm. the dollar. Right. Yeah. I think that devaluation was completely <clears throat> understandable and completely legitimate because, after all, the RMB had been linked not to a basket, but broadly speaking to the dollar, and as a result, over the last few years, has had a very significant real appreciation because the dollar had gone up. And this is a relatively small uh, adjustment downwards. The difficulty is that we are in an environment now where people are then trying to ask, well, what does it mean for the future? And this is complicated by the fact that China now clearly has significant short-term capital flows. Up until three or four years ago, you could pretty much understand the movements in China's foreign exchange reserves by looking at the current account deficit plus foreign direct investment in or out. So we knew that there wasn't all that much hot money. But what has happened over the last few years is there's a bigger unexplained bit which we find much more difficult to understand. And this always happens in process of exchange rate and capital flow and current account liberalization. Once you've gone completely to liberalization of the current account, once you've got a large amount of foreign direct investment flows, and once your corporates and your financial institutions are getting more and more uh, sophisticated, what you find is that there are all sorts of mechanisms for corporates to do things which are essentially short-term <coughs> capital flow speculations, uh, but counters current account uh, 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 manipulations, etc. when they remit funds that they've received, or what their borrowing technique is, whether they repay borrowing at the end of the period. And I think all this illustrates is that the inevitable direction of change will now be towards capital account liberalization, because once you've gone a certain way down the path, uh, you, 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 you have to go uh, the rest of the way. Uh, I still think there is a role for some categories of capital account control, but that's where we are now. And it's the combination of the small devaluation plus the evidence from the foreign exchange reserve figures that we're now getting a large amount of capital outflow, which has then generated a set of debate about whether this is going to be followed by a bigger devaluation. And that's what's really excited the discussion around the world. You are right, because it's kind of virtuous cycle. If you predict that RMB will continue to devalue, yeah. then the capital flow will, yeah. will get bigger and bigger. How yeah. are you concerned about the, this kind of capital flow, outflow? We can well, see the you, numbers you, you, picking you, up and the reserve is shrinking. Ultimately, you cannot control that once you become a fully internationalized currency. Let's be clear that that is the case. If you look at the relative movements of the euro against the dollar over the last 15 years, up and then down, or the dollar against the yen, only a small amount of those changes can be explained by differences in relative interest rates or by the competitive condition of the current account. The majority of those movements, and they're often quite dramatic, if you go back to Japan in the 1980s and the whole Plaza Accord debates, etc., huge movements, are essentially driven by changes in sentiment which drive fluctuations in currency far bigger than can be explained by an inflation rate differential theory. And that is simply the way the world is for fully international currencies, which means that as and when China fully internationalizes, it has to accept that that is part of the consequence of it and it yeah. has to live with that consequence. I agree with uh, Lord Turner. The short-term capital movement in China is increasingly frequent, and uh, it occurs in the trade account. Also, I would like to add that there are many uncertainties about the uh, Chinese economy, or people are still uh, speculating, or um, they are still trying to figure out uh, what, is the, what is the real situation of the Chinese economy? So we can find a lot of uh, predictions, a lot of uh, guesses. So even though the journalists are on holiday, they're still very interested in the Chinese situation. 
So the uh, question is, should RMB continue to be stable or we should devalue a little bit according to the market force? And also what kind of implications will this have for the global markets? Uh, I think um, if we're seeing a somewhat slower growth in China and inflation is very low, it's logical that uh, there is a more expansionary monetary policy and the implication of that is, is that the currency depreciates somewhat. Uh, in the short run, I think this is natural if we're seeing uh, the renminbi becoming, the RMB becoming a, 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 an international currency. In the long run, it's necessary for the Chinese economy to have a, a, an open capital account. So, so in the long run, it's, it's good. I think it's very important um, to try to keep currency fluctuation out of <coughs> political debate because a currency is, is a thermometer for, yeah. for the economy. It should be a part of monetary policy and not the political symbol. So uh, China is going to play an increasing important role in the global economy. And with an open capital account, it's, it's, it will be natural that the currency in the short term fluctuates. And I agree with, with Lord Turner that these fluctuations will not be rational uh, because markets are not rational. Uh, uh, and therefore, I think we should just uh, uh, accept that that's a fact of life. And, and the, the most important thing that the, the Central Bank of China can do is to conduct, that, conduct monetary policy so that, so that growth in China is stable. That's the most important for the global community. Do you hear that the uh, independence of the PBOC should be strengthened? Excuse me? P independence of the central bank. Uh, well, I, I believe in general that the experience of independent central banks that try to uphold price stability and, and to accept currency fluctuation has been the better model uh, uh, to run monetary policy in, in many countries. Thank you. And now let's move to our Japanese friend. And we know that the latest news story is that uh, in the recent G20 finance minister and uh, uh, the central bank governors meetings, and after the uh, elaboration of the, uh, the policy uh, rationale by the Governor Joe, and the, uh, uh, the international community began to broadly support the uh, PBOC's move on the uh, 11th of August, but we have exception. <laughs> Uh, who is the uh, uh, finance minister of the Japan, uh, Tara Aso. And he said that uh, maybe the, the policy is not that good and the uh, uh, elaboration of the Governor Joe is not that uh, detailed. Do you agree with your finance minister? Well, thank you very much for raising a very interesting question. Uh, <laughs> minister Aso and I worked together in the government for a long time. And his opinion and my opinion are always different. <laughs> and this time also, my opinion is different. Uh, I basically support the policy choice of Chinese government this time. Uh, we're considering the very unstable uh, asset market and considering the foreign reserve situation. <clears throat> well, at that time, that uh, decision making was uh, reasonable, I think. However, at the same time, uh, not only Japanese, but also many investors in the world uh, had a, a little bit uh, mixed feeling. That is because, well, uh, we always say the exchange rate is decided in the market, supply and demand in the market. But in the case of renminbi, uh, the, the political decision making is very important. Central bank, the independence of central bank we discussed, but central bank uh, uh, is now a part of the uh, government now. State council. So, uh, the state council. So in that sense, this is a political decision. So we are, have now have a very mixed decision. Yes, as a political decision, it's understandable, but still, so uh, we expect more uh, independence of the central bank and more flexible uh, trade on the capital market. Well, uh, we are now going to in discuss the internationalization of renminbi. We had a very similar discussion in 1980s and 70s, as was mentioned by uh, Rose Turner. Uh, we are not successful, actually. Uh, but actually, mm. the currency had basically had uh, two functions, basic functions. One is a uh, means of payment, means of uh, uh, exchange. Yeah. There's, uh, considering the size of the Chinese uh, economy and the trade volume of China, uh, the internationalization of the renminbi is very important. Already it's uh, internationalized in a sense. Uh, however, at the same time, assume you have one billion US dollars. In this case, do you want to keep this asset in US dollar denominated asset, euro denominated asset, or renminbi denominated asset? This means our currency has another function of the uh, keep or have carry a wealth value, to save wealth value. 
in that sense, our people are, in the world are expecting much more free market system of uh, China and the independence of the central bank. In that sense, we now have a, a, a little bit mixed feeling. But as far as the decision making of August 11, 11th concern, well, I'd like to support uh, the idea of central bank of uh, China. Uh, this is very much different from my, uh, the Minister of Finance of Japan's idea. Thank you. And we, uh, if we look into the future, I think the market also very much concerned about the uh, uh, direction of the RMB. Will it continue to devalue in the long run and in the short run, or it will remain to be stable because of the, uh, the aim of internationalization of the RMB? I'm wondering if uh, any gentleman want to pick up the question. Well, there is, there is no long-term fundamental reason for the RMB to depreciate. Uh, China has high competitiveness, a large manufacturing sector, uh, basically well-run public <coughs> finances. So there is no fundamental problem with, with higher inflation and low competitiveness. But in the short run, I think uh, uh, monetary policy in China most likely needs to be slightly more expansionary. So it might be uh, depreciating in the short run, but in the long run, it all comes back to whether the Chinese economy is structurally well footed, and that depends on whether the government, as we heard uh, Premier uh, <coughs> Li today, argue for more structural reforms. And if they do that uh, and continue to open the economy, China will be strong, and then the currency also will be stable and strong. I would like to add. I agree uh, with the previous panelist talking about uh, the long-term development of RMB. I don't think it's necessary to think about whether RMB will depreciate in the short term or the long term. Because in the past, we found that actually uh, RMB is pegged to the US dollar and uh, the fluctuation is not so uh, large. Now, the latest market response is justifiable because RMB remained stable and all of a sudden uh, there was uh, some fluctuation. So I guess more fluctuations will make people get used to them. And uh, just now, uh, it is mentioned that stability for the longer run uh, is the better choice. And I believe that uh, we should make RMB stable against a basket of currencies. This will be more beneficial to the world economy. But uh, it is expected that uh, the US dollar will appreciate. So um, com compared with the US dollar, RMB will depreciate. Do you think this is another a monetary po a war? Well, I think you have to put this question into the global context. I believe the existing uh, situation is quite like in the 1997 or 1998. Everybody was nervous. Uh, everybody was uh, quite sure that uh, the U.S. Uh, is go was going to increase the interest rate, but nobody knows knew when. But if the RMB depreciated again, we can expect the consequences. For one thing, the emerging economies uh, will continue to depreciate their currencies. And the second, um, with the RMB depreciation, our export to the world, as they are all denominated with US dollars, then the Chinese export uh, will be offset by such uh, depreciation. So in the final analysis, we would find that it, it would do no good to the world economy. So my suggestion is in the coming months or in the coming year, uh, let's keep the RMB stable. If we want to make some um, manipulation, then maybe the RMB can be appropriately eased uh, in order to offset the US dollar appreciation. 
then we would have uh, the interactive or the two-way uh, changes. And RMB should be a, a semi-internationalized currency. A basket, or should we target dollar in the short run? I think I'm sympathetic to the idea of targeting a basket. Uh, I'd like to begin by saying that if I was any good at forecasting <laughs> medium-term foreign exchange rates, I'd be a very rich man and considerably <laughs> richer than I am. Uh, in the very, very long term, if you wanted me to predict, I think the RMB will rise in real terms because that's what tends to happen with emerging uh, economy currencies according to some classic conditions which are called Balassa Samuelson conditions. A, there's a fundamental theoretical reason if you took a 20-year period uh, where it might appreciate. But I think looking forward over the next several years, we know there is a very significant slowdown of the Chinese economy going on. Uh, we know that that is a large slowdown actually throughout East and Southeast Asia, uh, partly because of that. And there will therefore, I suspect, be more easing of Chinese monetary policy. And I think that might tend to produce a further tendency for a decline uh, against the dollar. The thing that I would be very cautious of, and I was pleased to hear uh, Premier Li saying today that it was not the intent, is to make a competitive devaluation a deliberate aim of policy. Because the great difficulty with competitive devaluations is we can't all do it. Now, the fact is you can't attack China for discussing it because other countries discuss it as well. Uh, I have heard speeches by Governor Kuruda of uh, Japan who when asked what is the transmission mechanism of his QQE, his quantitative and qualitative easing, talks about the exchange rate mechanism. I have certainly heard speeches from Mario Draghi, who when asked what is the transmission mechanism of your QE, talks about uh, a fall in the value of the euro. Uh, but if the euro go down and the yen goes down and the RMB goes down, I mean, we're left with only one country uh, which is, is going up. So I think the sensible approach here is to run Chinese monetary policy to achieve a reasonable stimulus to the Chinese economy, but a non-inflationary stimulus, and to combine that probably with some management of the exchange rate so that one produces some degree of stability rather than too wide oscillations. And I think I agree that the logical thing to do would be to manage that somewhat against a basket then rather than specifically against the US dollar. Jingkou在上半年缩了百分之十五,进口呢几乎就是当然七八月份降了一点,上半年还是略有增长的,所以今年的外贸顺差将会达到五千亿美元以上。那么在贸易顺差增加的情况下,如果贬值的话,但是我
decide whether MB will be incorporated into SDR. We know US dollar, Euro, Japanese, uh, and uh, sterling are already in SDR. That will you vote for the RMB to be included into this basket? <laughs> will you vote? Will you vote? Well, yes, of course. Well, unanimous. <laughs> <laughs> so, Walter has a different view here. Well, I think it has to be based on an objective evaluation. Uh, there are a set of criteria. There actually weren't originally when the SDR was set up, but when it was uh, redone as the smaller basket, when the Eurozone currencies get together, a, a set of criteria were written down about the extent to which is used in trading activities, the extent to which it is truly convertible, it doesn't have to be completely free capital account, etc. And I think if you look at those criteria, it is absolutely certain that some stage pretty soon, it may be one year, maybe three months, uh, you know, China will be included in. Uh, I don't think it makes much difference whether it's this year or next year because I think the trend is going. So I, I, I'm going to be a purist and say if you ask me to vote in November, I will look at the staff papers and I'll see as best as possible whether the criteria are met. I'm absolutely confident that the criteria will be met within the next few years, but I think it's quite good uh, to have a, a rule-based approach to these decisions, <laughs> and maybe they won't be precisely met in November. Maybe the IMF will say in November, well, they're almost met, but these are the bits that have to occur before we say. So I'm a supporter of China coming into the SDR, um, but I'm not going to sort of say that uh, if I was on the IMF board, I'd necessarily vote on November before I see the facts. Great. <laughs> Well, I, I spent the last eight years in, in the um, Council of Ministers in, in, in Europe, and uh, I've noticed that uh, rules are rules, but yeah. they are sometimes <laughs> bended somewhat. So uh, we will never be purists when it comes to economic policy. Um, the important thing, in, I think, is the criteria. And the, the ambition from, from the Chinese government to be a part of the SDR, I think, is, is very good. And I think they should use the criteria to continue the reforms of, of the capital account. And given the important role that China is playing in the world economy, I think it's very natural that, that uh, the, uh, the, the RMB becomes a part of, of the, the SDR system. But the important part here is that China continues to move towards upfilling these criteria. You are very right, and according to my uh, knowledge, that the uh, technical criteria, criteria can be met. Uh, under the trade and the, also under the uh, usable, uh, freely usable. But the question is that because the, uh, the inclusion into the SDR needs the voting, 70% of the votings of the IMF board, and we know that the United States plus Japan accounts to 23%. So there's something tricky there in November. Will you, any of you want to, uh, I, I think Dao Kui or uh, Professor wants to comment a little bit on that. Well, I am not representing the Japanese government. I do not know the idea of the Minister of Finance, Minister Assos. Uh, you disagree with them? <laughs> no, no, no. This time I hope I, we have we reached agreement. But, but anyway, important point is, well, the, the huge, uh, China already has a huge size of the economy. Well, the dollar denominated GDP of China is about 2.3 times of that of Japan already, and about 60 times of that of the United States. And the China is the second largest absorber or importer in the world. So China is already playing a very important role uh, in the world trade. As I mentioned already, currency has a very important function as a means of exchange, means of payment. In that sense, it is quite uh, natural that uh, we invite Nambimbi to the SD, part of the SDR. At the same time, a kind of dynamic politics is uh, uh, requested or expected by inviting or uh, renminbi into the SDR basket, may this will uh, uh, accelerate the reform of renminbi, reform of the Chinese financial market. This is exactly what I expect. But at that time, I'd like to talk about a little bit bitter experience, bitter lessons of Japan in the 1990s. While mid 90s, <coughs> we had the Japanese government had a very comprehensive financial liberalization, or uh, liberalization in the name of uh, big financial big bang. Well, this was welcomed by many economists. However, the huge amount of non-performing loan, a bad asset, was hidden in the balance sheet of the banking sector. And because of that, uh, this liberalization created the, the very unstable asset market situation. 
So the sequence of the policy is very important. The first of all, I really expect the background, the, uh, we, you provide the uh, very transparent information system and uh, provide the, uh, the information about the bad asset, uh, shadow banking, including shadow banking, and the disposal of a non-performing loan. And this kind of very combined effort is needed for the financial uh, liberalization in China. But we really expect that because the China is, a very, is playing a very important role concerning its size of the economy. Thank you. Mm. Low Turner, do you share the same view? Well, what I wanted to say is you, you focused on the voting rights at the IMF. Uh, I very much hope that nobody is going to vote on the basis of the politics of this. We ought to approach the <coughs> SDR on a technical basis as to what is good for the world because a lot of what people say about international currencies is, I think, complete and utter nonsense. Uh, there's a belief that somehow by having your currency a reserve currency, it makes you richer and you sort of fight against the hegemony of other people and that if you're the existing hegemonist, you should prevent it. I remember back in the 1990s, people telling me that we needed a euro in Europe to fight against the strength of the dollar. And I remember thinking at the time that that was one of the most logically incoherent sentences I had ever heard. <laughs> I mean, it's just rubbish. You know, currencies don't fight one another. And the size of your currency in the world doesn't necessarily give you a, a degree of advantage. China should see internationalization of the RMB not as something which is necessarily going to give you all sorts of competitive advantages, because it don't, won't, but simply as the absolutely natural an automatic con a, a consequence of the rising size and importance of China in the economy. And the rest of the world should see it the same way. An awful lot of our language of currencies fighting each other for dominance um, is a, a, a statement which is simply syntactically meaningless. So there's no currency war. Yes, something very funny inside. Whether we should put a car... A RMB into SDR. SDR is not a currency. And transaction volume or amount of SDR is very small. Financial product dominated by SDR doesn't exist at all. If you talk about the criteria rules, you do not have to artificially produce a rule. You have to take SDR as a basket of a currency or a kind of a if we take it as a criteria, of course, our RMB will be interested in to uh, be included into SDR. If you're not a part of SDR, the SDR is not the real SDR. So theoretically, RMB shall be incorporated into SDR. The rules are not always constant. The rules are keep, keep been changing. You know, uh, so uh, given the size of the RMB and given that its a current account is not open yet, so it is very meaningful for RMB to be incorporated. The second, how to be incorporated into SDR. I don't know whether Jap Japanese people is going to vote for that, but I think the American people will be quite cautious. The Ministry of Finance, which is the leading uh, this issue, they will privately uh, inform the Chinese government they will not vote at present, but uh, we can provide you one, two, three, four, five conditions, and then if you meet these conditions, then I'm going to vote for that. Last but not least, RMB as international currency or other international currency, what are the benefits as an international currency? Of course, there will be a lot of things very beneficial. if. The U.S. dollar is not an international currency. When the financial crisis happened to the state, it will bring a lot of major crisis to the international payment. They have to borrow greatly to make up for its deficiencies, and this will trigger a lot of systemic risks. So as international currency, it will benefit the country. It has a lot of advantages to make their currency international one. But it takes time, and the process of being uh, internationalized is quite complex and a long term one. Well, the Japanese has uh, taken the initiative, uh, a great effort to internationalize the yen, but not uh, successful in the end. Well, the target is good, but uh, the whole process is complex and painstaking.
I quite agree with Professor Dao Kui on that if RMB is internationalized, it will address the kind of uh, currency mismatch if your uh, asset and liability are not denominated by the same currency, it will uh, you know, suffer some uh, crisis. Uh, the US has not such a kind of uh, uh, issue because uh, your asset and uh, your liabilities of the states are dominated by the same dollar, uh, denominated by the same, same currency that is the US dollar. I quite agree with this. If international trade is uh, denominated by RMB, then there will be no foreign exchange risks. We do not have to consider that potential risks. Another point about the voting, I don't know uh, whether the U.S. will vote for that, but I learned from a friend from the state that uh, the U.S. may have to vote for uh, for RMB's inclusion into SDR because the U.S. has realized it is uh, quite a mistake not to be the member of AIIB. Mm. Someone says that it is uh, the, one of the biggest mistakes the U.S. has made ever since World War II. Well, even the, the mistake has been uh, made, so uh, the U.S. Is, mm, will not make another mistake. More to receive questions from you, from the audience. And please uh, identify who you are and try to be uh, brief for the questions. Any, yeah, the lady in the first. And then the gentleman. <coughs> Thank you. I'm from Bloomberg. My name is Zhou Bo. Thank you for your wonderful insights. Just now, panelists have mentioned that as a payment currency, RMB has already been well acknowledged as an international currency. However, as an investment currency, as the capital market in China has not been open or liberalized fully, we can see that the FDI accounts for a very small share of the total. Actually, starting from last year, uh, the Chinese government has made a lot of effort to liberalize the capital market. And uh, uh, we have uh, the uh, Shanghai Hong Kong Connect. And so my question is, for all the panelists, for the liberalization or the further opening of the Chinese capital market to the foreign investment in the current context where we have uh, a big fluctuation in both the stock market and uh, the uh, bond market, uh, what will be the impact? I think I will collect all the questions. Sorry, only one. Um, OK, yeah. Um, so for Yiping and uh, uh, Professor Dao Kui, um, uh, uh, Professor Lee mentioned uh, um, China should kind of stabilize its uh, exchange rate uh, going forward. Uh, but with the uh, foreign exchange kind of depleting very fast, how would China have the tools to do that? For uh, uh, Professor Huang, um, so you say uh, it should kind of uh, be allowed to depreciate. But how is how to uh, distinguish excessive volatility? IMF also said in the next two to three years, China should achieve managed float. Thanks. Any more questions? We will collect the, all the questions and answer them together. Yeah, so connecting the short <coughs> to the longer term, my impression was also that there was already a paper by the IMF which proposed to delay the decision on the SDR accession and probably a deal behind the scenes. And moreover, that that contained a proposal to move the midpoint of the renminbi, which then was exactly the activity taken which took to this uh, devaluation. So that seemed to be a step which was much in line with um, advice from technical advice from within the IMF, but probably also caused by a resentment of the US to support that vote. Some people even argue that it requires an 85% vote. So I would like the people to comment on that. And then uh, similar going forward into the long term, if a country opens the capital account, it's always the same. If you do it from a position of strength and growth and uh, international admiration, you get massive capital inflow. Everybody 
capital inflows, investment inflows, everybody's happy. If you do it from a position of nervousness and, and volatile markets, uh, there is the risk in China, of course, of capital outflows and capital flight like in any other developing economy. And my question uh, in particular to those experts from China would be, do you see as a result of this volatility the last few weeks the possibility that the opening of the capital account will be slowed down despite the first part of my question, the central bank uh, doing what it can and what has been told in order to, uh, to get the renminbi more international? Thank okay, you. Thank you. More questions? The lady here. Hello, I'm from uh, CBN. Today we read uh, news that uh, the chief economist of uh, the central bank uh, said that uh, the PBOC has uh, eased the conditions. Then we found that the offshore uh, RMB value is against, is running against the current um, value. So what will be the impact? Um, I've got one question for a Japanese expert because there are a lot of talks about uh, further expansion of your uh, QQE program. However, there's also another concern that Japanese central bank's uh, balance sheet cannot suffer anymore. So how do you see these two kind of different opinions? <laughs> and if um, Japanese yen continue to depreciate, what will be its inf uh, impact on emerging markets uh, currencies? Thank you. We can have one more question here. Yes, my question is how critical will it be to provide more transparency in in from the government for becoming a, for for the renminbi to become a real international currency. You mean the transparency uh, communication from the PBOC, transparency right? Transparency in the policies and and, Great. and the information that the government provides to, yeah. to the I rest of the world. I think we have we have collected uh, uh, enough questions for us to respond. I, I think that maybe the uh, uh, the Chinese uh, panelists respond first, okay. and then they are. Uh, 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 <coughs> May I first respond to the uh, opening of the capital account? question. Uh, according to my observation, the opening of the capital account will be continued. And uh, basically, it will follow the original schedule. But there is one condition that is for those items which are, for those accounts which are not opened, uh, they will receive uh, more strict regulations. The, the problem in China is ineffective or uh, ineffective implementation. So for those malpractices, I guess, I believe that uh, the uh, PBOC and uh, the uh, Foreign Exchange Reserve Office will strict, strict the uh, regulation. As for another question about uh, the uh, foreign investment in the operation of the foreign investment in China, uh, my understanding is that there should be further liberalization. However, the key here is that our stock market should be improved and the quality of uh, the listed companies should be improved. We should uh, try to introduce high quality foreign companies stocks into China. Uh, take Apple as an example. It is making money in China, um, many of its products are produced in China and uh, are sold in China, gaining big profit. Then maybe we can have uh, Apple stocks uh, listed also in China. So with a stable capital market, uh, we would have a stable flow of capital. And uh, the uh, RMB could had, uh, would be more appreciated in the international market. I agree with Professor Li. 
after this latest round of uh, fluctuation, I'm sure PBOC will be more alert to the uh, fluctuations. And I believe that the it is an appropriate time to advance the liberalization of the uh, capital market or capital account. Now, uh, we enjoy a lot of favorable conditions. Then uh, there's a low risk of the outflow of uh, uh, the capital. However, reviewing the emerging markets in the past 30 years, we can find that the financial crisis in those countries are usually triggered by the uh, inflow of a large sum of the uh, foreign investment. And uh, when these foreign investment flow out, the financial crisis occurs. So I guess, or I believe that uh, this, the current uh, market might be offers uh, might offer a fairly favorable condition for the liberalization of the capital accounts. Then how can we avoid the over depreciation um, or excessive depreciation? My suggestion is to implement the uh, proposal that has been made in 2005, that is to take reference from a basket of currencies. Uh, now we still have uh, the room to uh, intervene and uh, the PBOC have the tool, has the tools to uh, intervene. So I don't think there will be excessive depreciation. And also to prevent the potential excessive depreciation, I think the key here is to stabilize the Chinese economy. With a stable economy, the uh, RMB could hardly depreciate. Point two <coughs> things. So money is about Japan's QQE. Yeah. Well, I think Mr. Kurada will continue the QQE, either or uh, expand its policy. Well, important point is Japan's QQE is different from that of the United States and some of the European countries. In the case of the United States, QQE policy was taken just after the Lehman shock. At that time, Japan, Bank of Japan didn't do anything special. But two, just two years ago, <laughs> our government decided to do that in order to conquer the deflation. The purpose is to conquer the deflation. So it is quite important to continue this policy. Otherwise, we cannot change expectation in the market. So I'd like to also support Mr. Kuroda's idea. Uh, the second point is uh, capital account liberalization, capital account liberalization issue. Well, it is uh, very important to cap, uh, liberalize uh, these things. However, this will give investors freedom to invest. At the same time, freedom to uh, make a capital flight. In that sense, as I mentioned, <coughs> The sequence of the policy is very important. Why asset market, including stock market and exchange market, is so volatile? The reason, one of the main reasons is the real economy is very volatile. Real economy, or GDP statistics is so reliable or not? Many people are watching, or not GDP statistics, rather electricity consumption, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it is very important to to to. to uh, enhance the transparency of the economy and the reliability of the economy, the confidence of the economy, uh, as was mentioned by Premier Li. It is quite necessary and important for the Chinese economy. Lord Turner. Can I just return to this issue of what are the benefits of... I don't deny that there are, there are some. And you've, you've, you've mentioned the benefit that your trade can be in your own currency without exchange rate risk. What, what do we know about what tends to happen? We, there is an extraordinary tendency across the world when we switch, we have a new reserve currency for it to go from one which is sort of 70% dominant to another which is 70% dominant. We've never had a 50-50 pattern. We went from an environment where sterling, UK sterling back in 1914 was 70 or 80% and then we're all, a few other currencies used 10% or so, and then we switched to a model where the US dollar was dominant and people used the, uh, the euro, but it's, it's much less than the US dollar. There seem to be some extraordinary strong processes whereby the world focuses on one store of liquidity, one uh, numeraire, and I think we, we frankly don't know how that's going to play out. 
What I'm sure is going to happen, and will be for the benefit of your economy, and I think for other economies in East Asia and Southeast Asia, is I think that the supply chains of Southeast Asia and East Asia will predominantly redenominate uh, in terms of using the RMB as the transaction account <laughs> in exactly the way that the euro is not a huge uh, a, a reserve currency or an internationalized currency in terms of trade between Latin America and North America or Latin America and Asia, but it is the dominant currency in terms of trade flows between Poland and Germany or Turkey and Germany. In one's immediate area and along the supply chains that exist, I think we would see that, and that would be to the benefit. How about the capital side? Is that to the benefit? Now, clearly, if you are a relatively small open economy which borrows and are not a reserve currency and you tend to borrow in US dollars, you're a Turkey, you're an Indonesia, uh, there is a disadvantage which is the uh, exchange rate risk on your capital account. However, I can't see an environment much coming up in the future where China is going to be running such large current account deficits that it is a big borrower from the overseas and therefore I think the relative advantage mm. in borrowing in RMB versus dollars is neither here nor there. And on that area, some people sometimes say, ah, oh, but we were if it were a reserve currency, we wouldn't have this our risk in our foreign exchange reserves. Just be aware, that is a nonsense. Foreign exchange reserves have to be claims on another country. <laughs> Right. And unless the U.S. is going to start issuing its treasury bonds in RMB, as long as you run current account <laughs> surpluses and the U.S. runs current account deficits, right. you're going to end up owning U.S. assets and they're going to be denominated in dollars. As for whether the U.S. gets a huge benefit from being the international currency, it's called the exorbitant privilege, as President uh, Giscard d'Estaing once called it, Obviously, they have the fact that they can run large current account deficits and they don't wor have to worry about how they'll be financed because someone in the world is going to want to hold dollars. On the other hand, that has been a double-edged sword for the US because the flip side of those current account deficits has been credit booms which have occasionally got out of hand and caused major problems. So I think there is an advantage on the trade side. I think it will show up in the supply chains of East Asia and Asia. But on the capital side, I think broadly speaking, you know, there'll be advantages and disadvantages. And the disadvantages can be uh, considerable. Uh, to the extent that Japan became uh, a reserve currency, an uh, internationally traded currency, a currency in which people <coughs> speculated, uh, in the 1970s and 80s, it wasn't necessarily to Japan's advantage. Indeed, the very major appreciation of the Japanese yen mm -hmm. in the late 1980s, after the Plaza Accords, driven by capital flows wanting to invest in the Japanese yen because everybody thought it was going to go relentlessly up, were a major problem and a major determinant of the crash of 1990 from which Japan's economy has never fully recovered <coughs> rapid growth. So just be aware there are problems to be managed as a result of this process as well as some advantages. Thank you, Lord Turner. We only have one minute left. So uh, I think, the, uh, Andersberg, you have the final word. Maybe you want to address a little bit on the transparency issue and uh, other issue, if you well, like. I, I think the, the major challenge for the Chinese economy is to continue to grow fast while reducing the dependency on investments. This means that the domestic economy is going to play a much bigger and more important role. Um, the important thing for the global economy is that China continues to grow. That is a part of stable glo global development. So the best way of solving this is actually to focus on structural reform in the domestic sector, to get the state-owned enterprises to be more efficient, to have a larger part of the resource allocated uh, done by market prices. This is difficult, uh, and it's the same problem that we have in Europe. Uh, it's the same problem they have in Japan, that the, the domestic sector is too regulated and, and too little competitive. And that is actually the best way of stabilizing the development of the currency. So to do the transitions from a high investment uh, economy while also opening up the domestic economy and being more efficient. Transparency issue? Well, uh, transparency will help, but uh, we have seen many 
uh, transparent central banks like the Federal Reserve commit terrible mistakes. So <laughs> it really doesn't help if you don't deal with your fundamental structural problems. And I would agree with Lord Turner that the reserve currency have actually helped the US to make a number of very serious mistakes. Great. We're just on time. And please join me with a big applause to uh, thank our panelists. And we hope that uh, the RMB will become international currency uh, soon. And please enjoy the, uh, the rest of the meeting. Thank you.